Okay, so we've introduced the idea of a discrete Fourier transform, which is essentially a way of taking a vector of data and transforming it into a bunch of Fourier coefficients that are uh, the amplitudes of sine waves and cosine waves of higher and higher frequencies that we would add up to reconstruct our data. But I think that these ideas are really going to make the most sense when we apply them to a simple example. Okay, so the simple example that we're going to use is the sum of two sines example. Okay, so remember I said that some functions are really well approximated by sine waves of different frequencies, and that's, that's basically what we're going to be doing here. So first I'm going to create a simple signal with two frequencies. So I'm going to have a dt of 0.001. I'm going to create a time vector, t equals o colon dt colon 1. Okay, so this is going to go from 0 to 1 in increments of dt. And then we're going to create um, a sine wave x, x equals sine of 2 pi times the first frequency, which is 50 times time, plus sine of 2 pi times 120 times time. Okay, so this signal x is just the sum of a, a first sine wave at frequency 50 hertz plus another sine wave at frequency 120 hertz. Okay, so I'm adding up two sine waves and this should be well approximated by sine waves. Okay, so this is a good example of something that would be well approximated in the Fourier transform domain. Okay, um, so let's just make a figure. Figure one, we're going to subplot two by one by one and we're going to plot time by x. Uh, in line width uh, 1.2. So let's run this. Okay, great. So this is our sum of two sine waves examples. You can see that there's kind of two frequencies that are adding up and uh, doing some interesting stuff. If I zoom in, you can see um, you can see these sum of two sine waves. Okay. So x is my, my data, my vector of data x, and we're going to run it through and we're going to get x hat. Um, this is my clean data. But let's say that I add some noise to my data. Okay, so I want to add a little bit of noise to this data, so add noise. And so my vector y is going to be x plus some noise. Let's say 1 times rand n. This is a Gaussian random number vector of the same size of uh, x. Okay, So for every value in x, I'm going to take and I'm going to add a random number to that value in x uh, with random with uh, variance 1. Okay, So this is Gaussian random noise with variance 1 that I'm adding. And let's plot this also. So let's say, uh, let's plot t by y in red. Let's put an axis up, so that's 0 to 0.25 five, negative five to five. And let's say legend clean and noisy. Okay, I should probably hold my plot. So let's hold on so that I get both of these in the same plot. Okay, great. So we had our clean signal in blue. I'm zooming into the first quarter, the 0 to 0.25 of the signal. And on top of that, this red is noisy. Let's increase the value of our noise a little bit. Let's say that this noise is even bigger. Let's make it 2.5 times uh, rand n. OK, so we have super noisy data in red. And it's basically our clean true signal, this blue signal, plus a bunch of Gaussian random, random noise. OK? And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the signal and we're going to Fourier transform it. And we're going to look at where the power is, how, like which sine waves in our Fourier transform have a lot of amplitude. OK, great. So now we're going to compute the Fourier transform. We're going to compute the fast Fourier transform. Remember, this is just a fast way of doing that discrete Fourier transform that we talked about before. Okay, so the FFT, the fast Fourier transform, 
is a discrete Fourier transform. It's just a fast way of doing it. OK, so we're going to create this figure. Um, and let's say we're going to, um, OK, so n is going to be the length of time. This is how many data points we have. It's how tall our data vector is. And we're going to say that big Y equals FFT of Y, comma n. And this is a pretty common notation. So we could have either called this y hat, but sometimes you would denote uh, your real data as lowercase y and your FFT frequency data as capital Y. That's also kind of a common, a common notation. So it's really easy to do this fast Fourier transform. You just say FFT of y, and I'm telling it how many data points I have, comma n. Okay? So this is the magic is happening right here. This computes. FFT, the fast Fourier transform. Good. Now, I told you um, that these Fourier coefficients, they tell me how much of each of these sine waves I need to add up to get my data. But because our data was generated from two dominant sine waves plus some noise, we would expect that certain Fourier coefficients would be much larger than others, probably the coefficients corresponding to 50 and 120 hertz. Okay? So we're going to look at something called the power spectral density. This is a very, very common way of looking at how much power is in each of those frequencies. And the power spectral density is essentially given by, uh, we're looking at the magnitude of each of these Fourier coefficients um, in Y. So a way to do that is to say y dot times the complex conjugate of y. So the FFT gives me complex numbers out. Uh, and I want to divide that by big N. So this is the power spectrum. And this is um, how much power in each frequency. Good. And now we're going to just plot this power spectrum. So I'm going to create a length 1 to floor n divided by 2. Um, I'm going to create a frequency vector. Frequencies equal 1 divided by dt times big N times a vector of 0 to n. Okay, so I want to create an x-axis in my frequency domain. And this is frequencies from low frequency up to high frequency. So that's what these frequencies are. Um, and we're going to do this now as follows. So we're going to say plot the, frequent, the first L frequencies. And we're going to plot the PSD, the first L PSD elements. And I'm going to label this. Uh, X label is my frequency in hertz. And my title is power spectral density, the PSD. OK, let's hope this all runs nicely with no errors. Good. OK, perfect. So what we did here was we took this noisy red data. That was my y vector, this noisy red data. We basically are acting like we don't know this clean underlying signal. That blue signal, we act like we don't really have access to it. All we have are these really noisy red measurements. This is often the case that our measurements are super noisy. And I take those red measurements, I run them through the fast Fourier transform, and I get the Fourier coefficients. And that's basically you know, how much of each sine wave of different frequencies do I have to add up to get this red signal. And when I plot, how I, when I plot the amplitude of those Fourier coefficients, that's what I'm seeing here. So there's a bunch of background noise, right? because this is a noisy signal. So there's a bunch of background noise. And then I get these two huge spikes in the power spectral density. And notice I get a spike at 50 hertz and a spike at 120 hertz. And this is no coincidence because my signal was built as a sum of a 50 hertz sign plus 120 hertz sign plus a bunch of noise. Okay? So this is actually really good. Our power spectral density, when we, even when we apply it to noisy data, is able to extract the dominant features of the underlying signal. This is super cool. This, kind of gives us an idea that we might be able to use this to get rid of some of the noise. Okay, And let's just use the data cursor tool to see exactly what frequencies these are. OK, so MATLAB thinks that this is a peak at 49.95 hertz. That's really close to 50. And it thinks it has another secondary peak at 
119.9 hertz. Okay, so it's not exactly the right frequency because of my, my DT, but this is almost exactly 50 hertz and 120 hertz. And recall that my signal, my, sign, my, my base signal that I added noise to had a, a 50 hertz and 120 hertz sign. Okay, so the Fourier transform is essentially giving me a vector of coefficients and it's telling me what frequencies are on in this data. So 50 hertz and 120 hertz are on. Okay, great. So the last thing we're going to do is we're going to take that power spectral density function, this function here, and I'm going to make a hypothesis. So my hypothesis is that anything above 50 is really a real signal. It's, it's actually there. And anything below 50 is maybe just noise. It's background noise, sensor noise, like it's just contaminated data. So I'm going to take this vector of Fourier coefficients and I'm going to try to find everything that's smaller than 50 and I'm going to zero it out. I'm just going to get rid of all of those noise and I'm going to keep my two big peaks and I'm going to try to use those to reconstruct my signal and denoise it. Okay, so this is one of the really powerful things you can do with a Fourier transform. Okay, good. So now we're going to use PSD to filter out noise. Okay, and in MATLAB, this is actually super easy to do. PSD is a vector of my power. And I'm just going to say um, indices equals PSD greater than 50. So find all indices uh, with with large power, okay? So we're finding all indices with large power greater than 50, and what this is going to do is it's going to spit out every index of this PSD vector, every location in this PSD vector that has a value greater than 50. So in this big vector of my power spectral density, it's gonna pick out the 50 hertz row and the 120 hertz row, and those are gonna be the indices that get kept. And then I'm going to say, well, PSD equals PSD dot times my indices. Okay, so indices is going to be a big vector. It's going to be zeros everywhere where the power is less than 50. And it's going to have ones where the power is greater than 50. And so if I multiply my power spectral density by this big indices vector, so let's just draw this out. So let's say that my power spectral density um, is you know, some noise, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, uh, and then it's really big, 100, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and then it's really big again, 50, let's say 50, uh, 55, and then 0 0.1, okay? And remember, this is what my power spectral density vector kind of looked like. This would be the, the row corresponding to 50 hertz, this would be the row corresponding to 120 hertz. And then this thing would keep going. There would be a lot more entries. And, you know, this is just a cartoon. So this is my PSD. And if I run this indices equals PSD greater than 50 command, then my indices, it's going to be a vector that's the same size, but it's going to give me a zero if this value is less than 50. So zero, zero, zero. And it's going to give me a 1 or a true if this value is greater than 50. So 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and so on and so forth. So it gives me indicator, essentially indicator variables for where my power spectrum is greater than 50 power. And then if I dot times these, I literally just multiply every row and I get a new vector of 0, 0, 0, 100. 0, 0, 0, 55, 0, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so that's what we're doing here is we're taking our PSD and we're just zeroing out everything that's less than 50. Okay, good. So we're zeroing out, zero out all other indices. We're going to hold on and we're going to plot. Now we're going to still plot our frequency, our first L frequencies with our new filtered power spectral density, and we're going to plot that in red. And we have our ori original and filtered. Okay. So what we have here, you can see in, um, in blue, 
you can see in blue here was our original noisy power spectral density, and it had two spikes. And in red here, these are our new filtered signals. So all of the noise has been zeroed out, and I just have my two big peaks remaining. Okay, that's what we wanted. We wanted to filter out all of the noise. Okay, and now the last step is to use those indices, those good indices where we actually had power but not noise. And we're going to use those indices of our fast Fourier transform, and we're going to inverse fast Fourier transform a vector with those indices. Okay, so our y is also going to equal um, indices dot times y. So we're going to do the same trick of zeroing out all of our Fourier coefficients that didn't have a lot of power. So we're filtering our Fourier coefficients. And now I'm going to say y filtered equals the IFFT of y. And IFFT is the inverse fast Fourier transform. So once I have my Fourier coefficients, I can also inverse fast Fourier transform and get my data back. I can get an, a, my, my data vector back. So this is inverse FFT. This is not Apple's uh, IFFT. This is the inverse fast Fourier transform. And we're going to go back to figure one. And we're going to go to subplot uh, two by one by two. This is our second subplot now um, in the bottom. And we're going to plot our uh, clean signal and our filtered signal. OK, so let's try that. So we're going to plot t by x in blue with line width 1.2. We're going to hold on. And we're going to plot our t and our y filtered, our filtered version, in red. And I'm going to use the same axis, 0 to 0.25, negative 5 to 5. And a legend is going to be clean and filtered. OK, good. And notice that we have this remarkable performance now. So we took this red, noisy, terrible signal. We Fourier transformed it. We looked at how much power was in each frequency. And we saw that most of the frequencies had just noise. And there were only a few powerful frequencies. So we zeroed out all of the stuff that was below threshold that we thought was noise, and we only kept the high power frequencies, which corresponded to 50 hertz and 120 hertz. And then when we inverse Fourier transform that new filtered uh, set of Fourier coefficients, we get this beautiful uh, red filtered curve here, which almost perfectly agrees with our clean underlying signal. So this is kind of an over our, all overall view of how you would use the FFT to take a signal. You would look at its frequency components. You might use it for some filtering or for, for some purpose. And then when you inverse Fourier transform, you reclaim a signal back you know, in the actual time domain that uh, is a nice, clean, filtered signal. OK? All right, thank you.